practice monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Nina Schooler will present early team-based treatment for people with psychotic symptoms, the Raise Early Treatment Program Experience. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds research around the world that identifies the causes and improves treatments that will ultimately result in preventative techniques and cures for mental illness. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $328 million in research grants. We are the largest funder of mental health grants outside the federal government. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in the grants given directly to our researchers who are working to find scientific breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Nina Schooler. Dr. Schooler is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. In 1998, she was a recipient of a NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant and is a member of the Foundation Scientific Council. The Council identifies the most promising research ideas to fund with Foundation grants each year. Dr. Schooler's work centers on the long-term course of schizophrenia and its treatment. She is especially interested in the first episode of psychosis, the relationship of psychological and pharmacologic treatments, and treatment adherence. Schizophrenia-related topics addressed by Dr. Schooler range from adherence to medication using cognitive behavioral therapy-based strategies, clinical trials of medications, long-term relapse prevention using injectable antipsychotic medications, and the development of improved assessment instruments for symptoms and social functioning. Earlier in her career, she led multi-center trials of medication and psychosocial treatments for schizophrenia at the National Institute of Mental Health. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Schooler's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Schooler and she will address as many of them as possible. And now, I'm very pleased to present Dr. Nina Schooler. Nina, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, let me see if I can bring up my slide set. Here we go. Okay, let me put this down. Okay. Um, I hope you can see this. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, have the opportunity to do this. Um, one of the highlights of my professional career has been my ability to serve as a member initially of the NARSAD uh, Scientific Council, which was the earlier name for the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and now for BBRF. It's a very thrilling experience and powerful uh, to be able to provide the kinds of support that BBRF does, particularly the support for young investigators. And it's been a, a joy for me to watch the growth of the young investigators from um, people who I mentored or people who I knew as junior uh, to people who are now colleagues and indeed uh, respected leaders in the field. So with that, I'd like to turn uh, to talking about um, early team-based uh, treatment for people with psychotic symptoms, and in particular, talk about the RAISE Early Treatment Program experience that our group has had. 
Um, here's our logo. RAISE is a research project of the National Institute of Mental Health, and Early Treatment Program is the name that we've given uh, to the intervention um, to the intervention and study that we have done under this initiative. Um, this is our executive committee. It's led by John Kane, uh, whose picture you see here at the top, and you see all some of the other key members of our research team um, pictured below. You know, usually people save the acknowledgments for the end, uh, for, and these are the people I worked with, and then there's a, usually a good picture of lots of smiling faces. We do indeed have those smiling faces, but for us, and for me in particular, um, the team part of this is so important that I really wanted to present it to you first. In addition to our group, uh, we also work with three principal NIMH collaborators. And I especially want to acknowledge um, Bob Heinsen, who is the director of the Division of Services and Intervention Research at the NIMH, and without whose vision and follow through, I might add, um, this program would never have happened. And then lastly, and maybe this is not lastly, this is equally as important, I want to acknowledge the 34 sites and the clinicians and participants at those sites who were part of our program. Again, this could never have happened without all of them. So what I'm going to do now is what I'd like to do first is describe for you the program for treatment of early psychosis that we developed which we named Navigate. And we chose the name Navigate um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first, it's not an acronym, so you can't decompose it. Um, secondly, what it spoke to for us was the fact that for people with first episode psychosis, navigating through the challenges that this represents, both the challenges of the symptoms, of the illness, of finding treatment, of relating to treatment providers, relating to peers and family members after the onset of illness is so critical. And so that's why we use the term navigate. So here we are, and this is a coordinated specialty care program, which is designed to be a comprehensive and integrated treatment intervention. Our over goal, overall goal is recovery. And by that, what I mean is maintenance and management, while those are terms that I've known for many years, that's not what our goal is here. The goal is to see people move from their first episode of psychosis into, into recovery. The second critical piece about the intervention is that it's team-based. The idea here is that no one individual has all of the skills and all of the resources necessary to help clients and help clients navigate their way to recovery. And you see here who we have on our treatment team: a program director, a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner who's a prescriber, clinical therapist. We have two of those, and you'll see why when you see the depth of that program, and a supported employment education specialist. And the reason for that is that if you ask people who come to treatment for first episode psychosis, what do you want? Mostly what people want is to get back to life as we understand it, to life that includes work and or school. One of the issues that is important about this program is it's run in the United States. And what that meant for us is that we wanted to include services that could be paid for through current U.S. reimbursement models. And as some of you probably know, um, U.S. reimbursement models are many and varied. Next, this is based on a shared decision-based model. And what that means is that decisions about treatment and which services people receive always include the client, and if there are family members involved, the family as well. 
For each of the interventions that I'll be describing, there are written, detailed manuals, and these are available on our website, raiseetp.org. And then lastly, we ensured training and ongoing, fidel an ongoing consultation to ensure that there was fidelity to the model. So here's a glimpse of what we see as the core skills that we want Navigate team members to have. Firstly, they need to be able to understand how to collaborate with natural supports because the team, the treatment team, are not the only people in, in clients' lives. Secondly, a committed belief in shared decision making. This is not an authoritarian top-down model. A focus on strengths and resiliency, appreciating what the skills are that individuals come to us with rather than just the skills that we seek to help them with. Enhancing motivation and also using a psychoeducational approach. And what that means is embedding teaching and understanding of new knowledge in a psychological framework rather than just a didactic one. So one of the critical elements in the, in the program is that Navigate teams meet together in person in a variety of contexts to carry out a variety of different activities. First, there is an initial treatment planning meeting for Navigate, which involves the team or team members and the client and relatives as soon as possible as we can do that, and usually with the first month of starting. There are treatment reviews which follow up on this initial treatment planning, which occur approximately every six months. The Navigate team, this doesn't include the client and or family members, meets weekly, and the goal of these weekly meetings is to share information and knowledge that different team members may have about the clients. And these team meetings um, are an opportunity to dis discuss all clients who are in the program at the site at that time. There's weekly supervision between the director and the uh, super and the um, um, supported employment education specialist, and there are also weekly meetings between the director and the IRT specialist. So here are the components. The first is psychopharmacologic treatment, and in keeping with the fact that we are navigating, the psychopharmacologic treatment provides a compass to assist that navigation. And it provides what's called measurement-based care and treatment. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Family, and I'll say more about each of these components later. Family treatment, which is, provides basic psychoeducation about the illness for the patient, for the client and family, and is module-based with particular goals that are focused on improving communication and problem-solving skills. Third is individual resilience training, which is also module-based and is manual-driven. And again, this particularly recovers, uh, focuses on recovery and growth. And I think one of the important things to mention here is that the, uh, the term resiliency is actually based in positive psychology, allowing us to link to these important principles. And then finally, supported employment and education, which it has as a goal return to these conditions, work and school in the community. This is not vocational rehabilitation. So now let me just describe each of the interventions with a little more detail. Um, first of all, the family program. It begins very soon, as soon as possible after the initial contact and introduces, includes the client, relatives, and if there are other significant persons in the person's life, um, they will be included as well. It's coordinated with the individual resiliency training, but it's very important that the person who provides the family uh, program is not the same person who provides the individual resiliency plan planning training. There's assessment and identification of client and family goals, education about illness and its treatment, 
monthly check-ins, the opportunity for family consultation, and if needed, modified intensive skills training. But that's not always part of the program. These earlier features surely are. Individual resiliency training is, as I said before, module-based. And what that means is that it's highly flexible. The modules are have an order to them, but they can be moved around outside of the order. And I'll talk a little more about those modules in a minute. Again, in the same way that um, um, family, plant, family treatment is, uh, individual resiliency training is goal-oriented. The IRT clinicians utilize cognitive behavioral skills because of information that says that these are highly important in helping people uh, to develop uh, skills and abilities on their own. And it's strengths-based. This is what I said before, the influence on po positive psychology and is modular in structure. We have a series of standard modules, which are indeed recommended for everyone, and then a series of individualized modules, which can be selected based on need and preference. So a little bit more about that. Here are the standard modules. And you'll notice that the last one, in, that each of these addresses an important issue and indeed points that I've already stressed. Orienting someone toward the program, helping them on initial goal setting, psychoeducation, which again focuses on an understanding of the illness, processing the illness, which refers specifically to the personalized illness experience that this individual has had. So again here, it's very, very much directed toward the individual, although there are overarching principles. Working on the concept of relapse prevention, because what's absolutely critical for everyone is not to re-experience the psychotic experiences that they had, which brought them into treatment. Final goal setting, You'll notice that this is something that cycles round, so we've had initial goal setting and now final, and then a really strong focus on developing resiliency, thinking about what to do when stressful events occur and things need to be done. Then there are the individualized IRT modules, and indeed because of the modular-based nature of the treatment, some of these can be introduced even before a client has had the experience of going through all of the standard modules. So if somebody is feeling depressed, the depression module might come up earlier in the course of treatment. Same thing is true about suicidal thinking, uh, post-traumatic uh, 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 PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, and anxiety. When we say coping with symptoms, not that the thing, negative feelings are not symptoms as well in the way that we often think about them, but coping with symptoms is really more focused on the symptoms that patients, clients with psychosis experience. Hallucinations, delusions and paranoia, the profound negative symptoms that can often affect people, and depression and anxiety as those are seen in the context of psychotic symptoms. The third area here is substance use. And we've come to recognize that substance use, particularly alcohol and marijuana, characterize about 50% of the people who present for treatment with first episode psychosis. So this is a really critical area. And then the final uh, section here is called having fun and developing relationships. And the reason that we me mention that is because it's so important when you're thinking about recovery to help people to develop strategies to get back out there and to enjoy themselves in ways that they used to and ways that they may have forgotten about as they're dealing with, this, with their symptoms of psychosis. The last of, of, of the four, um, I should say the next of the four areas is supported education and employment. And again here, this is originated in a supported employment model that was developed for severe mental illness. So this is not something that started 
as a strategy for first episode psychosis, but it's increasingly recognized just how important this area is. And again, this is focused on helping the client to return to work or school. And recognizing this is real work, real school, not vocational rehabilitation. The goals here are determined by client preference. But one of the things that we emphasize very strongly is that every client should be offered the opportunity to consider work in school. And if they're not ready for it now, our supported employment education specialist and the whole team is prepared to come back to it later. Supports are provided to help clients enroll or re-enroll in school, school and or obtain work or go back to their work. And then there's support for staying in school, staying at work, and it's coordinated, of course, with the clinical treatment through the team meetings. Pharmacologic treatment represents perhaps the bedrock on which all of these other treatments have to rest. One of the issues that's clear, and this is a critical issue for us in working out how to organize the program, is that first episode patients, people with first episode psychosis, have a better response to medication, antipsychotics, than multi-episode patients. The effective doses for them are considerably lower than for multi-episode patients. And despite the fact that we're using lower medication dosing, side effects are actually more frequent. This actually is a, represents an important clinical problem for prescribers. So the suggested sequence of medications between first episode and multi-episode pa patients and clients is actually somewhat different than the sequence that would be recommended um, according to the guidelines that are available. And so this represents a, um, uh, a challenge. You may remember, if you note it, remember the slide that I showed you early on uh, in this presentation, is that one of our challenges is that we're working in community settings. And um, I'm sure you didn't have time to count the number of settings um, that we were working in in the acknowledgment section at the beginning, but there are actually 34 of them. And these are 34 community mental health centers with busy clinicians at all of these settings who have clients other than the clients who will be part of the ETP program. So how can we help them um, to navigate, here's our, our um, uh, program again, how can we help the clinicians to navigate this challenge? And COMPASS was our answer. And it's a computerized decision support system, and it's a web-based application that was available to the prescribers in the program using desktops, laptops, or even iPads. And what it involved was the client coming in to the pro coming into the office completing a um, uh, an information form which explains how the person is feeling at the time and then that data is sent to the doctor or prescriber who completes the clinician rating form and then the two of them have the opportunity to go through and decide exactly what to do next. Um, the patient self-report is actually quite straightforward. It really is based on a yes or no response. And what's especially important about this um, from our perspective is that when the clinician is asking the person questions based on the questionnaire they filled out, those questions are framed in terms of what the patient, what the client tells the rater. Uh, has, has completed the rating form. So if the person has said, I felt depressed in the last week, um, then the uh, question would be, you said on the questionnaire um, that you've been sad in the last week. Um, uh, can you tell me more about that? If the person hasn't reported being sad, it would say, you said on the questionnaire that you've not had any problems recently feeling sad or depressed, but I'm still wondering, are there any problems not being interested in things that you usually enjoy? So this means that the person who's filling out the form 
he feels very recognized. Um, then uh, there are patient priorities to determine what the symptoms are that are most important that need addressing, and then there's a treatment selection screen that the prescriber sees that helps them to decide which treatment to use at that time and to select medications uh, according to what the person has already said. And in the course of this study, we know so far that people completed 3,939 self-report assessments. And I just want to give you a glimpse of some of the things that they told us because I think that's really important. The first is each time people are asked, do you want to discuss changing your medication? And the fact is that this happened 20% of the time that people filled out the questionnaire and about 80% of the time they said no. And the fact is that significantly went down over time. So the longer people had been in treatment, the less likely they were to say they wanted to change their medications, which meant that indeed the clinician and the client had reached a, a, a state of agreement on what the medications needed to be. Now, this is a very ambitious and impressive program that we developed, and that was one of the goals that NIMH had set us, which was to develop a program for first episode psychosis. But they also wanted to know, and of course we want to know, and you want to know, does it work? And so what we did in order to answer that question was to do what's considered the gold standard of determining whether a treatment works, and that's a randomized controlled trial known in the business as an RCT that would compare navigate our experimental intervention that I've just spent over 20 minutes describing for you to community care, which is treatment as it's offered in the United States currently. And what we did in order to do this are a series of things. First, we did what's called cluster site randomization. Did that in 2010. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Our expectation was that the treatment needed to be available for at least two years. And the information that I'm going to present you about the results of this study refer to that two-year treatment period. And our assessment model included on-site recruitment, engagement, and retention, and of course the collection of some information from people. But we use what we call remote assessors of our primary and secondary outcomes. And I'll explain a little bit more about that because it's somewhat different than what happens most of the time in randomized controlled trials. Here's the United States, and our ETP sites are in 21 of these states. As you can see, there are more along the East Coast than there are in the middle of the country in the West, but in point of fact, more of the population of the United States lives in the areas where we have our sites. So here's what we did, and um, this is the first clue about outcome. There were 404 participants who were enrolled in the study, and uh, at 17 of the sites, 223 people were enrolled in the Navigate condition. That is to say they received the Navigate intervention that I've described to you, and at 17 other sites, 181 patients received what we called community care. And I just want you to note that sometimes when people talk about a comparison condition, they talk about it as treatment as usual, a TAU. We don't think that our treatment was treatment as usual because, as I think I told you a minute ago, we had cluster randomization, which means that all the sites who agreed to be part of the study also agreed that once they'd agreed to that, they would then be randomly assigned 
to either navigate or community care. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Here's who the subject had to be. Remember that we said we wanted people in their first episode of psychosis, and so the age range that we allowed was 15 to 40, because we know that for many people, this condition starts early in, in adolescence and can also start much later. A SCID is something called the Structured Clinical Interview for DSM-4 Diagnosis, and we confirmed all of these diagnoses here using the SCID. And in order to be sure that we were looking at people who were early in the course of treatment, we wanted them to have no more than six months of having received antipsychotic medication. Now this is actually taken, not prescribed, because I think many of us know well that prescription does not mean that people have actually taken the medication. And then finally, we wanted this to be the first episode of psychosis for these people. So here's the problem that you have when you're using something called cluster uh, randomization. And that is, there are actually a series of problems, but let me address them in order. The first is that everybody at the site is going to know what treatment the people are receiving because that's the only treatment that people at the sites are getting. Either they're at sites that are offering Navigate or they're at sites that are offering community care. So what that means is that you have consistent, this gives you that the raters who are uh, at a distance are going to be um, uh, unaware of which site the person is at, and therefore they won't know the treatment condition. Um, another problem at sites is that if you have 34 sites, that means you have to train at least 34 assessors, and that means that we also know people are going to go on to other lives, uh, change their jobs, move, and so forth, and that means that training and the maintenance of reliability, which is a critically important feature in assessments of the sort that we were doing, becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult. And so what we did is we worked with masked remote assessors, and participants were interviewed over live and secure two-way video. I just want to say a word about that. Uh, for a minute, and that is when this model was first presented to me, I commented, oh, this will work fine for people who are depressed or anxious, but people who have psychotic experiences are just not going to accept being interviewed by somebody who's not in the room and who's on a television set. In fact, that may be particularly problematic for people who believe as many as some people with psychotic experiences do, that the television set at home is delivering messages. What was a great surprise to me is this is not a problem. And indeed, even people who have the delusional experience that the television set is giving them messages seem to be able to distinguish this person on the TV from the TV at home, which provides that. So here's the story of the RAISE ETP randomized clinical trial. We think this is a, a, this is a novel, not a unique clinical trial model, which used site or cluster randomization. And what's particularly important about this is that for the person who's going to be a participant, the consent does not evolve agreeing to be randomized. Treatment is provided openly, and that mirrors what clinical reality is like. That's not, we don't normally provide clinical care for people in a random context. And then finally, we, used, we ensured valid assessment by centralized masked clinical raters. We felt that it was important that there be long-term treatment, I've already mentioned this, which went on for two years. This is a U.S. study delivered in U.S. community settings. And then finally, it's a multidimensional treatment which incorporates known effective treatment elements. 
So let me tell you something first about who the people were who came into the program, and then secondly, uh, about our outcomes. So in terms of age, uh, people were on average 23 years old, which I think coincides well with our notion of when psychotic illnesses begin. There were more males in the Navigate con condition than in community care. In terms of race, you see the distribution here. And in terms of role functioning, which is an important issue, what you see is that at the beginning, in the Navigate condition, a smaller proportion of people were, work, were, were in school. That was a significant difference. But also a smaller proportion were actually were working at the time. And again, in Navigate, a, a slightly smaller proportion had been hospitalized before coming into the program. In terms of diagnosis, virtually about half of all patients, both in community care and in Navigate, were diagnosed with schizophrenia at the time that they entered the program. And indeed, if you extend that to schizophrenia spectrum so that it includes schizoaffective and schizophreniform, it was close to 90% of people who were already um, uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Now, one of the issues when you're doing a treatment such as ours, where there is a great difference between them, the question is, how do you know that the people who received Navigate actually received something different from the people who received community care? And we have a wide range of measures that we're going to be looking at in order to help us understand this. But to start, what we looked at was the client's perception of their treatment. And we asked the following questions. Have you had individual se sessions with a mental health provider who helps you work on your problems and look positively toward the future? And what that refers to is in people language, not in uh, tech talk, that refers to our individual resiliency training. And in all of these slides, there will be four of them, you'll see that the red line refers to, uh, to navigate and the blue one to community care. And every month throughout the study, a significantly greater proportion of people who were in the navigate sites said, yeah, this is, I've had one of, I've had one of, at least one of those. Here's a question for family treatment. Has your family met with a mental health provider to help them understand and address your situation? And again here, a significantly greater proportion of patients, clients, and Navigate said that that had happened to them. The model of this, you'll notice that it's a declining line, reflects the fact that over time this intervention faded as people had experienced um, uh, and had already had the benefit of it. The other thing that's the case is you'll also notice that this never rises to more than 50 percent. And part of the reason for that is that uh, even at the time of a first episode of psychosis, many people are already substantially disengaged from their families for a whole host of reasons. Here's the third one. Have you met with a person who's helping you get a job in the community or further your education? And here again, we see a significant difference between community care and Navigate. And finally, the last, um, were you asked to record your symptoms and side effects before you met with your psychiatrist or nurse practitioner? And what you see here um, is the difference between Navigate and community care again. And now what I want to talk about for the last few minutes, and I definitely want to leave a few minutes for questions at the end, are what were our major study outcomes. So you will remember that I said at the beginning that our goal was recovery. And what our goal is to see people um, having made substantial gains. The first thing that we want to point to is the fact that Navigate participants stayed in treatment longer than did patients, cl cl clients in community care. Again here, the red line is Navigate, 
and the blue line is community care. And what you see is it's not that everyone remains in treatment, but people remained in treatment longer in the Navigate condition than in community care, and that was statistically significant. The second, and I'm going to have to stop for a minute to explain what this means, is this is a quality of life scale, and the quality of life is the quality of life scale is a measure that looks at a whole range of things, including things like work and school, interpersonal relations, how you get on with people, um, how you feel about yourself, and then whether you're engaged in the in sort of what we call commonplace objects and activities. Um, things like having, having keys, having a credit card, and so forth. And what we're looking for here is to see, here's time, starting with month zero and going up as far as 24 months, and the blue dotted line is community care, and going up to the top of this scale is better than being down at the bottom. And what you see is that the community care group started a little ahead of the Navigate group, and they did indeed make improvement over time, but there was significantly more improvement in the Navigate group over time, so that even though they started at the lo a little bit lower to start, they end up a little bit better at, a be better at the end. And it's this sort of treatment by time interaction that we talk about when we talk about a time effect that is different for the two treatments. Let me show you the next one. Um, this is the percent with any work or school days, and we, we got this information uh, over time quite regularly. And here you see the Navigate group, and again, they start at a lower point, but they end up at, a, at about the same point that the community care group has, and that's also a significant group by time interaction once you control for the fact that this group was better off when they started. The next one is the PANS. The PANS is our measure of, psycho, of psychopathology, of symptoms of illness, and this shows um, the total PAN score. And in this scale, a higher score is worse and a lower score is better. And here again, we see a similar kind of difference. Although the Navigate group started off in a somewhat worse position, slightly more sick, they made significant gains over the first six months and sustained those gains until the end so that at the end they were somewhat better than those in community care. And this, again, is a significant, um, a significant difference between treatments. The third measure that we looked at was the Calgary Depression Scale, which is a measure of, of depression that is specifically geared uh, toward people with psychosis, um, with symptoms of psychosis. And here again, like with the, um, uh, the PANS, Going down means getting better, and here again we see a difference between Navigate and Community Care. We see it at six months, and then we see it again at 24 months. Now, one thing that, so just to summarize, we've seen an advantage for symptoms, specifically for all symptoms with the total score, specifically for depression. We've seen an advantage for work and school, and we've seen an advantage for quality of life. This, last, this slide here shows what we've seen of time to first psychiatric hospitalization. And for most people, this would have been a re-hospitalization. A re and I think what you can see here is something that it doesn't require a statistician to help any of us understand. There's no difference between these two groups. I should mention that the frequency of hospitalization, the percent of people who were hospitalized, was, real, was between 33, 34, 34% uh, in Navigate and 37% in community care. So this is a low rate of hospitalization, but a 
rate of hospitalization that did not differ between the two groups. If we have time at the end, I'd like to come back and comment on that uh, uh, for a minute. But the last point that I want to make has to do with, are there any patient characteristics, any client characteristic that help us to understand um, who will do better um, in terms of um, uh, receiving the Navigate intervention as opposed to not receiving it. And the one we've looked at so far um, is duration of untreated psychosis. In our work, we abbreviate that as DUP, duration of untreated psychosis. And what makes this an especially important uh, measure is that duration of untreated psychosis is something that we can think about changing. If we were to find that there was a difference, uh, say, in um, um, uh, residential area, in other words, let's say people in one area of the country uh, were, did better with Navigate than people in another, we're not really in a position to move everybody from one part of the country to another. But duration of untreated psychosis, which is the length of time from the first experience of positive psychotic symptoms to the time that people get first treatment, that's something that the system might be able to move if we thought it was important. And in point of fact, it's very important. So this looks like a very busy slide and the kind of thing that's hard to understand. So let me, let me try to help you through this. Um, uh, the, um, uh, these are quality of life scale uh, scores starting at zero and ending up at, starting at zero months and ending up at 24 months. And remember now, going up is better. And what we have here is if you look at the people who receive Navigate, and Navigate is either the dark red, the solid red line or the dotted red line, if they had a low duration of untreated psychosis, they did the best. And if they had a high duration of untreated psychosis, they didn't do any differently than did the people who received community care. In the group that received community care, it actually didn't matter whether you had a long or short duration of untreated psychosis. So what this tells us is that coupled with Navigate, reducing the duration of untreated psychosis may be an important way to go. So here are our conclusions. One, recipients of Navigate were significantly more likely to remain in treatment and experienced greater, outcome, greater improvement on our primary outcome measure, which was quality of life. They were more likely to be working or going to school. They had greater symptom improvement during the first six months, and those gains were maintained. DUP moderates the effectiveness of Navigate for quality of life, and that's a very important finding. And finally, in summary, these results show that a coordinated specialty care model can be implemented in a wide range of community clinics, and that the quality of life of first episode patients can be improved. And so with, with that, um, I just want to say again how grateful we are to the hundreds of clients and families who made this study possible with their time, their trust, and their commitment. Uh, being willing to enroll uh, and put yourself into a randomized clinical trial of the sort that we did is a very, very important step that people can take to help to improve treatments and care for others who will come after them. And so we are profoundly grateful uh, to the people who made that decision uh, uh, to trust us. And uh, we hope um, that we have um, validated 
their trust and that their participation was worthwhile. So thank you very, very much for your attention. And um, uh, Jeff, if there are questions uh, that you have from the audience and that you'd like me to try to answer, I would be more than happy to do so. Thank you. Um, absolutely. And I want to thank you um, for an excellent presentation and more importantly, for the work that you have been doing and continue to do that really um, has an impact on people's lives. So thank you for what, what you're doing. And obviously one of the areas of questions that we've received relates to this important issue of duration of untreated psychosis. And one of the questions a number of people ask is, what steps can a person take to get their loved one often a, a young adult child um, into treatment when they may minimize their symptoms, they may not want treatment, et cetera. What can people do to get their loved one in treatment sooner rather than later? Right. Uh, that's, that's such an important that's such an important question and, and one that we that that we clinicians, family members wrestle with uh, with all the time. And one of the um, issues that I think is important here is while we use the term psychosis and we say, well, the duration of untreated psychosis has been long. Um, and we refer, when we say that, we're thinking of things like um, auditory hallucinations, hearing things that are not, that when there's no one there, uh, delusions, which we define as false beliefs. But I think what we have come to understand and what's crucial about this is that for the person who's experiencing these, these are not false beliefs or, uh, or um, uh, unreal voices. These are genuine experiences. These are things that the person is experiencing. And the idea that you're having a real experience and that somebody thinks you need treatment for it seems almost to be at odds. It's not, I'm not sick. And indeed, uh, for most young people, um, the experience of sickness um, might have been perhaps having a, a, a pneumonia, uh, which, where it's clear that you're sick, or having had their tonsils removed, uh, probably more frequent in my generation uh, than in the current. So I think that the, the important issue in trying to help someone come to treatment is to focus on what goals and needs they have rather than on the things that we see as the hallmarks of a psychotic experience. And that would be for many people, um, they're, having, uh, they're having trouble uh, concentrating. Um, they're having trouble in school. They're having trouble at work. And trying to bring them to a setting where they can get help with things that they identify as problems rather than things that the family member or a clinical group would identify as a problem may be one way uh, to help family members, to help people come to treatment earlier. So that the treatment, the, the reason for coming is not the experiences which for the person are completely valid, but experiences and conditions that they might want help with. And I think that's probably the most important thing we can do. And that's why our shared decision-making model was so critical uh, uh, to the work that we did, because it meant identifying goals and concerns that people had. And if those can be identified a little bit earlier, uh, that would be enormously valuable. I should say that when we looked at duration of untreated psychosis, and I didn't mention this, the median half of the people had a duration of over a year before they received their first treatment. And that's a very, very long time. So clearly the people who are asking this question are on exactly the right track. I should also mention 
that the National Institute of Mental Health currently has a very ambitious research program that is seeking to identify what some of the issues are um, that uh, result in this long duration of untreated psychosis and what kinds of measures can be introduced to reduce it. I, I think that's, that your point is so important, I want to emphasize that, and this is I think part of the success of the program as you said, that we're not really looking to treat symptoms that we identify, whether we be the professionals or the family members, but issues that the person themselves find troublesome. And that's the way to really engage them and have them <coughs> see that the treatment is helpful to them. So I think that's such an important approach that you described. Um, one other question people are asking, given the, the success of this model, um, <coughs> if somebody lives in a location where the model oh. isn't available, are there ways for families to sort of put together a version of this model for their loved one? Oh, what, a, what an important and, and challenging um, question that is. So uh, let me comment on something that has happened uh, uh, since, we developed, uh, since we developed our program. The National Institute of Mental Health and SAMHSA, the Substance, Alcohol, and Mental Health Administration, have developed, SAMHSA actually, has developed a program with NIMH support that is seeking to enhance the amount, uh, the availability of treatment for early psychosis. The model is called um, a coordinated specialty care, and it differs from state to state. But there are programs now being established um, across the country. Um, the Navigate program, uh, as you saw, is a fairly intensive program. Um, I, I don't think that one can suggest that families can, quote, put together a Navigate program um, uh, for loved ones. But I do think that it's important to look at what kinds of programs may be available. This varies from state to state. And one of the other issues that I think is the case is it's, this, we're not talking about 100% availability across America at this point. And I, I wouldn't even want to speculate when that might happen. But there's an increasing understanding of the importance of this. And I think that going to various state mental health sites, it may be possible to identify where a center is that has such a program or has a program that incorporates um, some, of these, uh, some of these elements. Um, our group is currently involved in uh, training sites in a number of states, and there are other efforts uh, that are going on in, a similar, in similar models. Excellent. And we'll put the link on our website to, um, to the SAMHSA information that you described so people have access to that. That would be, that would be terrific. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, our time is just about up. I, we could go on for another hour. Um, I want to, again, Nina, say thank you for what you're doing. It has such an impact on people's lives and will make such a big difference for people. So thank you for your work and the work of the entire team that, that you collaborate with. Well, I've, I want to just take the last time uh, to acknowledge John Kane's um, uh, leadership in this. Uh, this would uh, never have happened if uh, uh, John had not had the, the will uh, uh, to develop the group that we had. And we had a, I think, unique group of investigators um, and um, 
investigators, clinicians, and uh, treatment developers um, who were able to put together uh, both both put together this program and also uh, engage in this um, uh, evaluation of it. It's been a long journey. Uh, if there are others who are in the um, who who work in this area on the on the call, I just want to comment that one of the most important skills that you have to have to do this kind of work uh, is being able to uh, have a very, very long timeline. Um, we started this in 2008, and we are just starting to see uh, the fruits of our efforts now. That's a very long time. But thank you. It's been a, it has been a, a wonderful experience for me to work on this program um, as it's been to be part of BBRF. And I especially appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to this group. Good. Well, thank you. And I know how much we all appreciate everything that you do. I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family members or friends, please visit our, web our webinar page at our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Lisa Montesia of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas will present a webinar entitled <coughs> Mechanisms of Antidepressant Effects. This will take place on Tuesday, May 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.